I'm sure you've all heard the old saying, it got so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Well, as I entered Donnie's bar, it didn't quite reach that level of silence, but it came pretty close. The usual lively crowd fell into a hush, transitioning from a boisterous party atmosphere to something akin to the quietude of a church service. The cause of this sudden drop in noise was seated in a secluded booth at the back of the bar, accompanied by another man, perhaps I should say her new man. The patrons watched in anticipation, their murmurs barely audible, as they awaited the inevitable confrontation between myself and her. My name is Chris Jackson, and they were all eager to see how I would react. The her in question is Gloria Price, who until two weeks ago was my fiancée. The guy she was with, Frank or whatever his name is, didn't really matter, he was just a pawn in her game to get under my skin. I made my way to the bar, where Donnie promptly slid a glass containing three fingers of Jack Daniels down the counter to me. He knows my drink of choice because I've been a loyal customer for many years, particularly in these past couple of weeks. Donnie's bar was my sanctuary, a place I would frequented at least once a week after work for several years. But over the last two weeks, I found myself here every night, attempting to drown my sorrows in Jack Daniels. I'm aware that alcohol doesn't solve problems, they're still there when you wake up the next day or sober up. However, alcohol has a way of temporarily numbing the pain and helping you forget. And I needed that oblivion, if only for a brief respite, from the incessant questions twirling in my mind. Why did Gloria betray me? What did I do to deserve this? The questions looped endlessly in my head, offering no solace or answers. I quickly polished off the remaining half of my drink, then leaned against the bar, fixating on the mirror behind it. Through its reflection, I had a clear line of sight to the back booth where Gloria and her companion sat. Our eyes met briefly in the mirror, confirming that she was indeed watching me. I grudgingly admitted that Gloria looked stunning. It was evident she had put extra effort into her appearance, likely with the sole purpose of getting a rise out of me. Her choice of attire, a dark green skirt that hugged her curves and ended just above her knees, accentuated her long legs, which seemed to go on for days. Topping off her ensemble was some sort of frilly top that left little to the imagination, teasing with a hint of cleavage. The light green hue of her outfit complemented her fiery auburn hair, striking blue eyes and the sprinkling of freckles across her nose and cheeks. I knew all too well from intimate encounters that those freckles extended to other, more intimate areas of her body. Combined with her classically beautiful features, Gloria was the embodiment of desire, a walking fantasy. As she moved gracefully through the room, she effortlessly commanded the attention of both men and women alike. Her appearance tonight served as yet another painful reminder of what I had lost. With a determined gulp, I drained the last of my Jack Daniels, pushed away from the bar, and made my way toward Gloria and her companion. Chris, Donnie's voice carried a note of concern. I know Donnie, I'm just going to talk to her, that's all. I reassured him, trying to sound calm despite the turmoil brewing inside. Timon, Chris, I don't want my place smashed up, he pleaded, his worry evident. It's okay, Donnie, I'm just gonna talk. I'll walk away before any trouble starts. Just like last time, I promised, hoping to ease his fears. The memory of last week flashed through my mind when Gloria had come looking for me and I had angrily demanded she stay away from me and from Donnie's bar. I had feared losing control and without waiting for her response, I stormed out. But this time, I wasn't going to leave. As I approached their table, my agitation was palpable and the guy seated with Gloria began to rise. I wouldn't want to be sitting down facing an enraged version of myself either. At 6 feet 4 inches and around 230 pounds of muscle, I was an imposing figure, built from years of hard work on construction sites rather than gym workouts. My steely gray eyes, usually calm, now bore into him with laser-like intensity fueled by anger. Sit down, I commanded as I reached their booth. He complied, but his smirk only fueled my fury. Hello, Gloria. I see you've brought the asshole with you this time. I addressed her coldly. The guide attempted to interject, but I silenced him with a raised hand, his smirk still firmly in place. I addressed Frank directly, hoping to appeal to some sense of reason. 
Friend, this is strictly between Gloria and me. Please just stay out of it, all right? I doubted Mr. Macho would heed my request, but I hope to have my say without any unnecessary trouble. Turning back to Gloria, I couldn't contain my frustration. Look, Gloria, I made myself clear last week. I told you to stay away from me and Donnie's. I don't want to see you, especially not with your lover. Gloria's defiance was evident in her reply. This is a public bar, Chris. I can come here if I want to. I felt a surge of anger at her audacity. Isn't it enough that you screwed me over right before our wedding? Now you want to flaunt it by bringing your asshole lover here. Her taunting only fueled my frustration. Why don't you find another bar then? I like it here, and we'll keep coming until you talk to me, she challenged. You don't want to talk, you want to justify your actions. I shot back, my tone icy. But I don't care why you did it. What matters is that you did. This is my place, it's been my hangout for years. You don't care about Donnie's, you just want to rub it in that you're with this dipshit now. I'm warning you, you won't like what happens if you keep showing up here. Keeping my word to Donnie, I turned to leave. But Mr. Macho couldn't let it rest. Hey asshole, I've got a few things to say to you. He piped up, emerging from the booth and clutching Gloria's hand. I turned to face him, begrudgingly admitting that the guy had a certain charm. Though not as imposing as me, standing at about 6 feet and probably weighing around 190 pounds, he exuded a certain presence. Clad in a sharp sports jacket, stylish shirt, and designer jeans, he could have easily graced the cover of GQ magazine. Designer jeans, for crying out loud, I thought, incredulous. What do you want, Mr. GQ? I couldn't resist needling him a little. First of all, whatever concerns Gloria concerns me. We're friends. Second, you don't get to boss her or me around. We'll go wherever we want, whenever we want. And third, I'm a third-degree black belt, so you don't scare me, he retorted, his smirk growing as he stepped closer to me. I couldn't fathom what was going through his mind. Perhaps his martial arts training had inflated his confidence, or maybe he thought displaying fearlessness would make me back down. Or perhaps he was simply showing off for Gloria. But Gloria intervened, cautioning him, Frank, don't. He's like a dangerous animal when he's in this mood. Well, Mr. GQ, you'd better heed your friend, because your mouth is writing checks your body can't cash. Take some good advice and get out of my face, I warned him. That's when he struck me. I'll give him credit. He was fast, and I didn't see it coming. His fist connected with my nose, sending me stumbling back. Before I could recover, he landed another blow, causing me to trip over a chair and land hard on the floor, taking a table and a couple of chairs down with me. As I regained my footing, Frank stood before me in some kind of kung fu stance, grain cockily. Without hesitation, I hurled one of the broken chairs at him. When he dodged it, I seized the opportunity and delivered a swift kick to his groin. It wasn't exactly sporting, I knew, but where I grew up, you did whatever it took to win. Doubled over in pain, Frank became an easy target. I grabbed his hair, hoisted his head, and unleashed a powerful blow with my fist. He crumpled to the ground, and though I had wanted to teach him a lesson for some time, I restrained myself, fearing I might go too far. Gloria's screams filled the air as I knelt down beside him, holding his head up once more. One thing they forgot to teach you at the dojo, Frank boy, is that every once in a while, you run into someone you shouldn't mess with. Guess what? I met Guy, I asserted, dropping his head and rising to my feet, my gaze fixed on Gloria. You're the one who should be lying there, bitch. This is all your fault. Now get this piece of shit out of here before you join him, I commanded. Normally, I'd never lay a hand on a woman, but my patience was wearing thin. Gloria's eyes bore into me with a mixture of anger and something unexpected, sadness. She knelt beside Frank and muttered, Damn you, Chris. Why won't you listen? With effort, she helped Frank to his feet and guided him towards the door. Returning to the bar, I was met by Donnie with another drink. I enjoyed the show, big guy, even if you did break a few things, he chuckled. Sorry about the mess. I tried to walk away, I replied, feeling a twinge of guilt. I'll cover the damages. Nah, that jerk knocked you into the table. He's the one who should be footing the bill. Don't sweat it, Donnie assured me.
As I sipped my drink, the scene was interrupted by the arrival of police and EMTs. They approached me from behind, ordering me to stand and place my hands on the bar, informing me that I was under arrest. But before they could proceed, a chorus of voices, nearly 30 witnesses, rose in unison, explaining that I had acted in self-defense. Turning to Donnie, the officers asked if he wished to file a complaint about the fight and the damaged fixtures, but he simply laughed and shook his head. No way, he said, dismissing the notion. The EMT tending to me explained that they had been called in after reports of a bar fight reached them, prompting them to alert the police. After assessing my injuries, he informed me that I needed to head to the ER. My nose was definitely broken, and the gash above my eye required stitches. It wasn't the first time my nose had taken a hit, but Frank must have landed a solid blow because everything after that was a blur. I promised to head to the hospital as soon as I finished my drink, eliciting a chuckle from the EMT. His partner returned from outside, reporting that the guy out there had a broken nose as well. He added with a smirk that Frank's groin was likely to be sore for a while. In even exchange I mused, perhaps I was even better off, considering Frank wouldn't be enjoying intimate moments with Gloria anytime soon. But then again, neither would I, gazing at my reflection in the mirror, taking in the swollen nose and the cut above my eye, I couldn't help but reflect on the series of events that had led me to my current battered state. Growing up, my mother played the role of both parents after my dad vanished when I was just eight. Alongside my grandmother, she raised me and my older brother Jacob, who was 12 at the time. Despite our modest means, we never lacked clean clothes for school, food on the table, or a roof over our heads. Our neighborhood wasn't quite the inner city, but it wasn't far off. It was a rough environment for a young boy to navigate, and many of my peers ended up on the wrong side of the law. Jacob and I, however, managed to stay out of trouble, thanks to the guiding influence of our mom and grandma. It wasn't fear of the police or jail that kept us on the straight and narrow. It was the thought of disappointing our ladies. The idea of seeing their disapproving looks, if we ever got caught stealing or worse, was simply unbearable. Jacob shared the same sentiment. When he turned 17, Jacob enlisted in the Marine Corps with mom's blessing. After completing boot camp, he came home for a brief two-week visit. I wouldn't see him again until my senior year of high school, a four-year gap and it would be several more years before our paths crossed again. My ladies instilled in me the value of education, ensuring I studied hard and learned as much as I could in school. Despite lacking the funds for college after high school, I followed in my brother's footsteps and joined the military. Enlisting for four years, I found myself unexpectedly assigned to the Corps of Engineers after basic training and AIT. It was there that I discovered a passion for construction that would shape my future. My first surgeon held me in high regard for my strong work ethic and willingness to lend a hand on any project, regardless of whether it fell within my expertise. As my tour drew to a close, the army dangled a re-enlistment bonus before me, but I declined. My heart yearned to return home, to reunite with my mom and grandma, and to contribute financially as they had supported me. So, bidding farewell to the army and the engineers, I headed back home. Luck was on my side, and I secured a position as an apprentice rough carpenter in construction. Over time, I diversified my skills, becoming a versatile worker in various construction specialties. Three years later, I crossed paths with Gloria. Our encounter took place at the bank where she worked as a teller. Needing to cash some checks, I accompanied a friend to set up an account. It was Gloria who handled my transaction, and soon enough, I found myself eagerly waiting in line just to exchange a few words with her. Though other tellers offered their assistance, I held out for Gloria. After two months of these brief interactions, I mustered the courage to ask her out to a movie. I was starting to think I'd have to make the first move, she replied with a smile. I'd love to go to a movie with you. Our dates became a regular occurrence, occurring at least once a week, sometimes more, over the next three months. Following our sixth outing, Gloria extended an invitation to her apartment. I didn't leave until the following day. In addition to her stunning looks, Gloria possessed an uninhibited nature in the bedroom that left me utterly captivated. Despite our growing connection, 
Gloria continued to go on dates with other men. We hadn't explicitly agreed to exclusivity, so I felt hesitant to broach the subject. Still, the thought of her possibly sharing intimate moments with others gnawed at me. We had plans for dinner on Friday followed by dancing on Saturday, and I intended to express my feelings and suggest we become exclusive during our dinner date. As we sat down for an after-dinner drink, I prepared to broach the subject, but Gloria spoke up first, catching me off guard. Chris, I hate to do this, but I need to cancel our plans for tomorrow night. Something urgent came up, and I won't be able to make it. I promise I'll make it up to you, she explained, genuine regret evident in her tone. Sure, no problem. We can go dancing next Saturday instead. But what happened? What's the emergency? I asked, not reading too much into the cancellation, but curious nonetheless. Gloria's gaze dropped, and she hesitated to respond. Alarm bells began to ring in my mind. Something wasn't right. Gloria, what's going on? I pressed, a note of urgency creeping into my voice. She sighed heavily before meeting my gaze. One of the other guys I see occasionally had an emergency, and he needs my help. What kind of emergency? And how can you help? I inquired, a sinking feeling settling in. This didn't bode well. Well, Frank's got this awards dinner for his company tomorrow, and his date came down with the flu or something and can't make it. So he asked me to step in, and I agreed. Gloria explained, her words tinged with uncertainty. Why does he need you to go? Can't he attend on his own? I questioned. It would seem odd if he showed up solo, especially with his boss and colleagues there. It might reflect poorly on him, like he didn't care enough to find a date, she clarified, attempting to justify her decision. Let me get this straight. You're ditching our plans that we made over a week ago to accompany another guy who only asked you yesterday. Is that what's happening, Gloria? Sarcasm dripped from my words. It's not like that, Chris. This is an urgent situation, she defended herself. That's exactly what it sounds like. I'm just relieved none of his other girlfriends fell ill. You probably consider that an emergency too and rushed to his aid. I retorted, my frustration palpable. Gloria seemed taken aback by my reaction, evidently expecting me to accept her explanation without question. I signaled for the check, settled the bill, and rose from my seat. Let's go. I brought you here, so I'll take you home. But after that, you're on your own, I informed Gloria sternly. The journey home was filled with tension. Despite Gloria's attempts to explain her actions once more, I remained silent, refusing to engage in conversation. Pulling up in front of Gloria's apartment, I reached across her and unlocked the door. Aren't you coming in tonight, Chris? She asked. You've got to be kidding me, Gloria. Get out. I responded, my voice carrying more intensity than intended. She complied, and I sped off, leaving skid marks in my wake. On Sunday morning, Gloria's name flashed on my phone screen. Without uttering a word, I ended the call. Persistent, she rang again, but this time I let the voicemail handle it. Her message was lengthy, explaining that her attendance at Frank's dinner wasn't romantic, merely a favor. She professed her feelings for me, urging us to have a conversation. Once the message concluded, I deleted it without hesitation. Over the next two weeks, whenever I visited the bank to cash my checks, I made a concerted effort to avoid Gloria. If her window was open, I opted for another teller. Ignoring her attempts to engage me, I steadfastly refused to acknowledge her. Some might label my actions as childish, but to them, I say, you weren't the one betrayed. It wasn't a matter of pride, it was pure, unadulterated anger at being treated so callously. Three weeks to the day, as I wrapped up a job site, I spotted Gloria leaning against the fender of my truck. Damn it, I thought, how did she track me down? Loading my gear into the truck bed, I unlocked the driver's door. Chris, she called out, almost shouting. You have to talk to me, eventually. No, I don't, I replied firmly, climbing into the truck. Are you just going to leave me here? I caught a ride with a friend and don't have a way back to the city, she expressed her concern. Could you at least give me a ride home? Oh hell, I muttered to myself, realizing I couldn't just abandon her here. I motioned for her to hop in, and we drove in silence. Despite her attempts to start a conversation, I signaled for her to stop and remained silent. 
Eventually, she got the hint and stayed quiet until we reached her place. As I reached across to open her door, Gloria unexpectedly snatched my truck keys and leaped out. Now you're going to talk to me, or you'll just have to wait here, she declared with a smug grin. I exited the truck, retrieved the spare key from the wheel well's magnetic holder, and held it up for Gloria to see. Climbing back into the cab, I started the engine, determined not to let her dictate the terms of our conversation. Chris, please, this isn't fair, she pleaded, her voice tinged with desperation. She had a point, it was time to address the situation. I glanced at her and gave a slight nod. Go ahead, talk. I allowed. Come inside, and I'll make you coffee or a drink, she offered. I paused for a moment, then replied, I'm good. Start talking. That night with Frank wasn't what you think. He just needed a companion for the evening. It wasn't a romantic date, she explained. We simply attended the dinner and came straight home. Yeah, but what happened when you got home? I countered, my tone laced with bitterness. Gloria looked shocked and impulsively hurled her keys in my direction. Screw you, Chris, she shouted, turning to retreat into her apartment. I'm sorry, I called out after her, realizing my comment had crossed a line. That was uncalled for, and I apologize. Please come back, and let's resolve this. She visibly calmed down and responded, I don't understand why you're so upset. I told you it was an emergency situation. No, Gloria. An emergency is when Frank calls and says he's cut off a finger or a hand, begging for a ride to the hospital. An emergency is when he calls, claiming he's fallen and broken his leg, desperately needing your assistance. Those are emergencies. Frank needing a date is not an emergency, I stated firmly, stepping out of the truck to face Gloria directly. Don't you see? When you broke our date to go out with him, regardless of the reason, you were indicating that I don't matter to you as much as he does. I was already unhappy about you dating other guys, and then you tell me that I'm not important enough for you to keep our date, I confessed, realizing the depth of my hurt by Gloria's actions. While I was familiar with my anger, the hurt took me by surprise. Gloria apologized once more, coaxing me into further conversation. Eventually, she persuaded me to join her inside for coffee, and then she convinced me to stay for dinner. I didn't leave until the next morning. Yeah, I know, I caved in. What can I say? I was half in love with her, and when she emerged from her room wearing nothing but high heels, my judgment flew out the window. Gloria hadn't changed during the three weeks we hadn't seen each other, she remained an attractive dynamo. The army and my time with construction crews taught me a lot, work ethic, doing the job right, and being dependable. But they didn't teach me how to navigate relationships with women. So, against my better judgment, I took her back. Gloria and I became exclusive, or going steady, as they used to say. We didn't see other people. This arrangement continued for about six months. She never broke another date with me, but there were a few nights she couldn't go out. She claimed she was visiting her mother or having a girl's night out or some other seemingly innocent excuse. Gloria and I didn't officially move in together, but we spent very few nights apart. I thought, if this is what married life is like, count me in. After a movie one evening, I proposed to her in Donnie's, of all places. It might not have been the most romantic setting, but Gloria seemed to appreciate the gesture. Through tears of joy, she said yes. We planned to tie the knot in three months, and I eagerly looked forward to building a family together, maybe even having kids. However, the month after I popped the question, I started hearing whispers about Gloria. A few of the guys from work teased me about having an open relationship with her on more than one occasion. I brushed it off as harmless banter until one night at Donnie's when Wendy, a friend and Winston's sister, approached me. Gloria was out with her girlfriends, and I was flying solo that evening. Where's Gloria tonight? Wendy asked, her curiosity peak more than usual. Hey Wendy, she's out with some of the girls from the bank again. I might have to rein that in once we're married, I joked. Chris, you might want to check up on your woman. She's been up to some things an engaged girl shouldn't be doing, Wendy said, her tone somber. What are you talking about, Wendy? Normally, I dismiss gossip and rumors, but coming from a close friend like Wendy, it made me pause. 
Wendy hesitantly confided in me that on three or four occasions over the past two months, she had spotted Gloria at Tommy's, and she wasn't alone. According to Wendy, Gloria was in the company of a handsome, well-dressed guy, and their interaction seemed more than just casual acquaintanceship. They danced intimately, getting close to each other in a way that didn't seem appropriate for someone in a committed relationship. Wendy assured me that there was nothing explicitly scandalous happening, but it certainly wouldn't pass the boyfriend test. I'm really sorry, Chris, but you're my friend and I hate seeing you being taken advantage of, Wendy concluded, her concern evident. I thanked Wendy for her honesty, finished my drink, and left. If it had been anyone other than Wendy, I might have dismissed it, but her words stuck with me. It was only around 10 p.m., and I debated whether I should check on Gloria. Memories of her emergency date with Frank and her recent girls' nights out flashed through my mind. Before I knew it, I found myself in Tommy's parking lot, a large club across town. Inside, the atmosphere was lively, with a bar along one wall and tables surrounding the dance floor. It was crowded for a weeknight, but I managed to find a spot at the bar where I could observe the dance floor. It didn't take long to spot Gloria. She had just finished dancing and returned to a table with several other people, including two guys. Most of them seemed to be Gloria's co-workers, which initially put me at ease. However, my relief was short-lived. Gloria and her dance partner sat down together, and he whispered something to her before wrapping his arm around her and pulling her close. She smiled and kissed him, not just a friendly peck, but a full-on passionate kiss that made my blood boil. Gloria wore a summery dress with thin shoulder straps that left her shoulders exposed, showcasing ample cleavage. After their kiss, the guy's hand lingered over her shoulder, his fingers occasionally grazing the top of her breast. Gloria seemed to revel in the attention, reciprocating by caressing his leg. Wendy's warning echoed in my mind. Gloria's behavior was far from acceptable for someone in a committed relationship. Downing the last of my drink, I pushed away from the bar and made my way toward Gloria and her companion. I had no intention of causing trouble, but I refused to tolerate this disrespect. Our engagement was clearly over, and I wanted my ring back, or so I told myself. But deep down, I hoped her friend and his companions would give me a reason to act. As I approached the room divider, my friend Winston intercepted me, blocking my path. He grabbed my arm, urging me to leave. Ignoring his attempts to dissuade me, I shook off his hand and turned back toward Gloria and her friends. Chris, don't do this, Winston pleaded. Going over there will only lead to trouble, and you don't need that. I'm not looking for trouble. I just want my ring back from that woman, and I'm going to get it. No drama, I'll just get my ring and tell Gloria it's over, I insisted. Bullshit, I can see it in your eyes. If you approach them, things will escalate, and someone will get hurt. You don't want to end up in jail over this, Winston mourned, his tone firm. I listened to Winston's warning, but was determined to push past him. Stay out of it, Winston. If I have to move you aside, I will, I asserted, trying to brush past him. He shook his head in disbelief, stepping back. I can't believe you're letting that cheating woman ruin your life. You're making a mistake, go ahead he muttered in frustration. As I attempted to move forward, I was met by Wendy standing firmly in my path. Are you going to push me aside too, Chris? Because if you do, you'll have to deal with me. I won't let you end up in jail tonight, she declared, hands on her hips, her gaze unwavering. I paused, taken aback by Wendy's unexpected intervention. Despite the gravity of the situation, there was a hint of humor in the absurdity of the scene, a petite woman standing up to a towering man to prevent him from making a rash decision. Having good friends was a blessing. Wendy and Winston's intervention had jolted me into rational thought instead of reacting impulsively. They were right. Approaching Gloria in that moment would only lead to trouble. After some persuasion from Winston and Wendy, I agreed to confront Gloria in a more private setting, preferably when she was alone. It was a sensible plan. I had no intention of harming Gloria physically, but I was determined to retrieve my ring and sever ties with her. As I drove home, I mulled over the situation. The more I thought about it, the more I realized I needed to resolve things swiftly. Parking a couple of houses away from Gloria's place, I waited for her to return. She shouldn't be too late, 
given that she had work the next day. As soon as I saw Gloria and the guy from the club arrive at her apartment, hand in hand, I knew tonight was the night to settle things. Whether she came home alone or with him, I was going to confront her and retrieve my ring. It was time to put an end to this charade. Around midnight, they arrived at Gloria's door, wrapped up in each other's arms. Their passionate embrace left no room for doubt. They were fully engaged in making out, tongues intertwined, bodies pressed close. Despite the pain of witnessing their intimacy, I didn't hesitate. I marched straight to Gloria's door, their obliviousness giving me an advantage. When Gloria finally noticed me, she recoiled, startled. Chris, what are you doing here? She exclaimed, panic evident in her voice. I'm here to end things with my deceitful, unfaithful fiancé. Give me back my ring, I demanded, seizing her hand and swiftly removing the engagement ring. Gloria's protests came in a flurry of cliches. Wait, it's not what it looks like. Frank's just a friend. We weren't doing anything. It doesn't mean anything, she pleaded, desperation tainting her words. Enough with the lies, Gloria, I said firmly, cutting through her attempts to deny the truth. Her eyes widened, hands instinctively rising to cover her face. I saw you with your friend at Tommy's. I witnessed the kissing, the hugging, his hand on you, and your eager response to his advances. And just now, I saw the makeout session right outside your door. As I confronted Gloria, Frank interjected, placing his hand on my arm, urging me to step away. Frank, you wouldn't be here if she hadn't invited you. So, I'll give you fair warning. Take your hand off me and stay out of this, I asserted, meeting his gaze squarely. He tensed, preparing to confront me, but Gloria intervened, stepping between us. Frank, please leave. Don't make things worse, she implored, her voice tinged with desperation. Reluctantly, Frank stepped back and made his way to his car. I'll call you tomorrow, Gloria, he said with a smirk directed at me. Don't leave on my account, Frank. Stay, go inside, and finish what you two started at the door, I retorted. Turning to Gloria, I delivered the final blow. It doesn't matter anymore because we're done, Gloria. I strode past Frank, heading toward my truck. Gloria trailed behind, tearful and pleading for my attention. But I remained silent, reaching my truck and driving off. After a few blocks, I had to pull over, overcome with shaking from the boiling anger inside. I needed to regain control before I did something I'd regret. After about 10 minutes of sitting in my truck, I restarted the engine and decided to head back to Gloria's. I couldn't explain why I felt compelled to do so, but I needed to know if Frank had stayed or left. As I drove past Gloria's apartment, I noticed that his car was gone. Surprisingly, that brought me some sense of relief. It's a cliché, but it's undeniably true. You can't just turn off your feelings for someone like a faucet, no matter what they've done. Even when you hate them, it's often because you still love them in some capacity. I suppose that's why I found solace in the fact that Frank hadn't spent the night at Gloria's. So here I am, nursing my Jack Daniels at Donnie's, contemplating which hospital to visit. I made a promise to the EMT, and truth be told, my throbbing nose and swollen eye are nudging me in that direction anyway. Gloria had been persistent with her calls after the incident at her door, but I steadfastly refused to engage. She'd insist that we needed to talk, and each time I'd bluntly refuse, hanging up without a second thought. Eventually, after about eight or nine attempts, it seemed like she finally got the hint. That's when she started showing up at Donnie's. A couple of nights after the confrontation, I was nursing my usual drink, showcasing the stitches over my eye and the bandage on my nose. Jack Daniels had become my reluctant companion in navigating through the nights. The bar was relatively quiet, with only about 20 regulars scattered around. Suddenly, a hush fell over the place, that classic moment where you could hear a pin drop. I glanced at the mirror behind the bar and spotted Gloria standing there. Oh, not again, I thought to myself. Chris, please talk to me, she pleaded. Just a few minutes, and then I promise I won't come into Donnie's anymore, if that's what you want. Fine, Gloria. Grab a booth, I relented. I'll get another drink and join you. Want something? After fetching my drink and a white wine for her, I settled into the booth across from Gloria. By the way, where's Frank boy? Didn't he want to join you? 
I couldn't resist a touch of sarcasm. She managed a slight smile. No, he said he never wanted to lay eyes on you again. Seems you rattled his confidence in his black belt. Bringing him along was a mistake, I admit. I thought it might provoke you into talking to me. Clearly, I was wrong, huh? You wanted to talk, so talk. Let's get this over with, I urged, eager to keep my pain hidden from her gaze. Gloria launched into the usual cliches, offering apologies and excuses that fell on deaf ears. She claimed it didn't mean anything, that it wasn't what it looked like, and that she loved me, but I wasn't buying it. I let her spout all the familiar bullshit until she finally ran out of steam after about five minutes. Enough, I interjected sharply. First of all, you don't cheat on or lie to someone you love. Let me tell you what it looked like. At the club, it looked like you were lovers. At your door, it looked like you two were humping each other like dogs in heat. That's what it looked like. And it did mean something. It meant everything to me. It meant that the woman I loved, my fiancé, the woman I was going to spend the rest of my life with, was a cheating bitch. No, don't start crying now, it's too late for that bullshit. Gloria's sobs grew louder, but she managed to compose herself enough for me to continue. I heard rumors and gossip about you partying with some guy on your girl's nights out, but I refused to believe it. I didn't want to believe that my lady would do that. It wasn't until a close friend told me she saw you that I knew you were cheating. I recounted, pausing to take a drink. Gloria seized the opportunity to interject. But I didn't cheat. I didn't sleep with Frank. We just danced and fooled around a little. Maybe I did let things go too far that night, but I wasn't going to sleep with him. I wasn't, Chris, she insisted. It isn't just about that one night, although that's a big part of it, I pressed on. You used your girls' nights as an excuse to spend time with Frank and lied to me about it. The first time you lied to me, you cheated. The first time you let him hold you too close as you danced, you cheated. The first time you hugged him or the first time you kissed him, you were cheating. Anger bubbled up within me once more, and I struggled to keep it in check. The fact that you didn't sleep with him doesn't change the fact that you were cheating, Gloria, I asserted firmly. I believe you would have slept with him if things had stayed the way they were. The next time, you probably would have invited Frank in. Let me ask you something. If you had known I was at Tommy's, would you have still acted the way you did with Frank? If I had been at your door, would you still have had the makeout session that I saw? Gloria hung her head for a few seconds before looking over at me. No, I wouldn't have done any of that if you had been there. It wouldn't have been right, and you wouldn't have liked it. Then what makes you think it was all right to do that shit behind my back? I paused, waiting for an answer, but she couldn't or wouldn't give me one. Okay, Gloria, we've had our talk and nothing has changed, I continued, my tone resigned. You say you love me. Well, that's your misfortune. I still love you, and that's my cross to bear. At least until I can get you out of my heart. Now I expect you to keep your promise and stay out of Donnie's. Goodbye, Gloria. With that, I got up and returned to the bar. Donnie saw me coming and had another drink waiting for me. It took a few minutes, but Gloria got up, walked past me, and out the door. I never saw her or Frank again. Later, I heard that she quit her job at the bank and moved to the West Coast, alone. It's been two years since Gloria and I went our separate ways. Donnie still sees me almost every night, but these days it's mostly for club soda or coffee. The Jack Daniels still makes an appearance, but only on weekends, and even then, I'm careful. Talking things out with Gloria that night helped me realize I didn't need it as much as I thought. Do I miss her? Absolutely, especially her in bed. She was unmatched. But it's more than just physical. I miss the idea of us, of having a family, and sharing a life with someone I love. Am I bitter? No, not really. I still dream of marriage and family. I haven't found anyone who ignites that spark in me like Gloria did. Still, I keep searching. I'm still in construction, but I know I'll have to find a way out soon. That fall from the scaffold wrecked my knee, and while I can tough it out for now, I know it won't last forever. About six months ago, my brother Jacob returned home with a wounded leg from his time in some far-flung, war-torn country. He relies on a cane to get around, but that's all right. Thankfully, he won't have to trek far behind the bar. Donnie, the previous owner, decided it was time to retire. 
Jacob and I seized the opportunity and bought the bar together. We managed to scrape together most of the cash ourselves, and Donnie helped finance the rest. Maybe I'll transition into the office, handling construction planning or scheduling, but even if I don't, I'm content with my stake in the bar. Plus, we've already started cutting back on expenses by doing away with the need for a bouncer. So here I am, embarking on a new career path and still on the lookout for the right woman. In the meantime, as an English friend of mine likes to say, life goes on. That was the first part of the story. A new video with the second part will be out soon. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.